Hey, oh. welcome to Vinyl Junkies episode seven. Record collectors are pretentious assholes and other stories. Hope you guys are having a nice weekend. Uh, we have a lot on tap today, so first off, we're, uh, I'd like to mention that uh, I have an official Grails announcement, something that we've been working on uh, with some of our partners over the last couple of weeks, so that's coming a little bit later. We will also be doing album reviews of uh, Vinyl Me Please's last uh, album of the month, which is The Nationals Boxer. I'll give you my impressions of that as well as show you the entire catalog. Um, I will also review uh, Link Ray's uh, self-titled album, which is an exclusive also in the VMP shop. Show you a bit of that, but uh, a few stories there. Sun Records does Hank Williams, a collection of Hank Williams songs done by Sun Artists. This one's cool. It's a Barnes & Noble exclusive. What's cool about this also is subscribe to the podcast and you can win a copy. Um, if not, visit Barnes & Noble, and guess what? It's available as of yesterday. So vinyljunkies.co slash podcast is probably the cheapest way to do it, but um, we'll talk about that, all right? Power Trip, Nightmare Logic. Yeah, man, reviewing a bit of metal, which is really fucking cool. I love this. So that's coming. And uh, finally, uh, our second prize, and... Uh, a big part of it is going to be a catalog review, a full catalog review of Explosions in the Sky, courtesy of uh, temporary residents that have been around since 2006, celebrating over 20 years of post-rock goodness. So you guys, if you see the link up there, go pick an Explosions in the Sky record. Which one do you like? Uh, at the end of this broadcast, I will be giving one of those away. All right. Does that sound fun? And finally, all the way at the end, we'll get a little bit into my bitterness and uh, why I say that. Um, I'll just give an example and uh, you guys can decide for yourself. All right. So why don't we start here? First off, <clears throat> um, should I start with the announcement? Yeah, let's start with the announcement. Or actually, you know what, let's pay some bills first and uh, do our pre-rolls, get our sponsors out of the way. Uh, Vinyl Me Please uh, sponsors the podcast, so it is brought to you, and many of the reviews come from their Vinyl Me Please shop. So visit vinylmeplease.com to get uh, August's latest The National uh, Boxer, really good. And uh, the record store opens next week with exclusive stuff, which I'll be talking about. And um, the, it, it's a packed store this time around. So uh, that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, next week should be a lot of fun uh, from a content point of view. This show is also brought to you by uh, the people who put out the Hank Williams Sun Records and the people behind the second giveaway. That is Org Music. Org Music, shining new light on seminal recordings from vinyl catalogs like CTI, Sun Records, Black Lion, the Atlantic, and Columbia Jazz Catalogs, and many others. Uh, lots of content coming up with Andrew Rossiter of Org Music. We're just going to take our time and try to do this right. Okay, so uh, now that we got the sponsors out of the way, how about I get to uh, a big announcement for me, a cool announcement. How many Grails fans? Why am I holding this Grails record? Uh, are there any Grails fans out there? Excellent temporary residence band. Uh, they've put out, what, eight, nine records. Uh, Temp Res sent me the entire catalog. I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet because I want to do this uh, entire catalog review like I've done with Mono and I will be doing with Explosions in the Sky, you know? Give me a chance to kind of uh, absorb the catalog in alphabetical, uh, not in alphabetical, Jesus, in chronological order and, uh, you know, give my impressions. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but uh, they will be going on tour. Grails will be going on tour uh, for just a month, for the first time in four years. Okay, uh, the tour starts September 12th and ends on the 27th in Nashville. They'll be coming to Montreal, and why I'm excited to be telling you this is because uh, Vinyl Junkies will be uh, working with that tour and with our friends at Vinyl Me Please and Temporary Residence to give you guys something really special. Um, Honestly, Tempres has been super cool 
in terms of the catalog. I think that they do packaging and design really well and offer a very complete value. Now, uh, Vinyl Me Please have long been supporters of that, and their member shop, uh, you know, likes to be very varied. So what it is that we've arranged to do is kind of try to coincide everything with the upcoming tour, which starts on September 12th. It's only North American, by the way, two Canadian dates and the rest are in the States. Uh, first in four years, man, uh, I'd go if you could. But we're going to give a little bit uh, of extra incentive. First off, uh, this Grails record here, which is the latest one, Chalice Hymnal, uh, will be available in the uh, Vinyl Me Please web store, which opens next Monday, not this Monday coming, but the Monday after. And what it is that I've done, uh, what it is that we've done all together is uh, we've arranged to have Vinyl Me Please ship you a little extra. So besides just a really gorgeous record, and I mean, the packaging is, if, if you like record porn, this is record porn. It's downright gorgeous, right? What it is that uh, we're going to, what it is that happens to folks who uh, get it through VMP shop, we'll get the extra poster as well. And uh, you'll be able to do some fun stuff with the poster and the other stuff, because uh, the other announcement is even cooler than that, if you can believe. Uh, Grails will be playing Montreal, so uh, we will have a chance to interview uh, for our upcoming podcast. Now, this is a really cool interview. All right. Um, the interview will be with ML Amis, uh, the drummer who actually replaced uh, Hakius in uh, Ohm. Right, so there's that whole sleep connection. Yeah, so he replaced Hackius at home in 2008. So uh, the drummer of the Grails uh, will be doing a uh, podcast interview with us, uh, ML Amos. As far as I know, I haven't really gone into this too much, but I'm looking forward to it. He sounds like an interesting guy. Uh, he's got his own podcast called Drifter's Symphony. So Emil Amos, uh, Drifter's Symphony. And... Um, I'm going to listen to it, and I was just reading a couple of quotes as I was preparing for this um, for, for, for this broadcast, and um, I think I caught something to the effect that he did drugs every single day for four years, and there was some kind of fucked logic behind it. So this is going to be interesting, and he's podcast savvy, so I have a feeling he'll probably wind up teaching me a whole lot. It'll be fun, and I'm a fan of the Grails, and we have the Grails full catalog review, and yes, we will give away a copy of the Grails at some point in the future, not now. Let's go a step further if we can. All right, uh, short tour. You guys show up with your album. If you bought it from VMP, feel free, man. Show up with your poster. Go see the guys at the merch table, man. They will have other vinyl there. Uh, they do have a nice vinyl selection. Get your poster signed. They'll be happy to do it. Get your album signed. They'll be happy to do it. Tell them you're from Vinyl Junkies. Um, they're vinyl people. They like talking wax, man, just like we do. So I think it's a real cool thing that allows us to get closer to the artists that we support and we love. It allows us to support temporary residents also, uh, you know, which supports the podcast. And Vinyl Me Please, who take chances on this type of thing and uh, allow us to offer these really neat things for you. So uh, expect this Grails record, Chalice Hymnal. Uh, which came out earlier this year on Temporary Residence, in the VMP shop with the extra poster. The tour starts on September 12th, ends on the 27th, very short, first time in four years. Bring your poster, man, get an autograph, get a picture, talk wax, and uh, it'll be fun. Let's see what the, uh, let's see what the interview uh, podcast comes out to, eh? Should be good. So that's my special uh, review for the day. Um, now we're going to go straight into our main album review, which is uh, Vinyl Me Please's August album of the month, The National Boxer. The reason it is that I pause a little bit is because I'm not used to saying The National Boxer because um, I've never, I don't know, I don't know The National. How else can you say it? I don't know The National. Before this package came through, I had no idea. As a matter of fact, uh, while me and Hessler were talking and trying to put together, you know, contents to deliver to you guys, uh, the National never came up because 
He knows it's not in my wheelhouse. Like, it's not something that I would just go out and buy, right? Not because it's not good. I don't know it. So uh, I always look forward to experiencing something so I can see what the big deal is. I can tell you with certainty that I never read anything before the album. I just knew that they were one of those quote-unquote pitchfork bands. I don't trust pitchfork bands. Um, I think pitchfork sucks a lot of the time. But um, I, what I do trust is in my own ears. And I gave it a listen. First thing that I looked at was Beggar's Banquet, right? So Beggar's Banquet, I'm thinking about some of those British bands like The Cult. And so right away, I thought it was a UK thing. Um, as it played, I also thought it was a UK thing. I don't know. There's this kind of like 80s thing happening here. Uh, I liked it. One of the first things that came to mind, no reading, right? This is just first needle drop was, and I actually commented when I um, posted this record up is, it's not fair to, like, I, I've just listened to it two times. It's not fair to talk about the record after two times because, or maybe it was just the first time, but it was very clear that there were layers there that would only reveal itself, uh, reveal themselves with extra listens. So I didn't even attempt. Now that's what exactly what wound up happening. Fact, okay? This is not in my wheelhouse. I put it on and right away understood that I'm listening to something that's deeper than what I'm hearing the first time, and I'm listening to something which I think I'm going to like. And I hear a whole bunch of instrumentation. And for me, when I hear a lot of tracks, I hear instruments just kind of like playing off each other. And, you know, I can hear, what, a dozen instruments? All right. Now I want to listen to it some more. So I put it on a second time. And I believe by the second time I started reading, right? Because uh, I want to know what it's about. Uh, I want to be able to put it in its proper context. One of the first things that I noticed with you guys was uh, when I posted up on Vinyl Junkies, immediately everybody started, get Alligator. Get Alligator. I haven't heard Alligator. I didn't know what Alligator was, but I know that get Alligator. I'm going to find out, right? So what winds up happening is that I wind up reading all of the reviews and I wind up reading all the news. You know, you just do the Google search and uh, try to kind of get a bit more information and realize that there are people that are completely fucking gaga over this band, so much so that there was one piece that uh, was the biggest fanboy article about how Boxer is necessarily the best album in the national catalog. Uh, I like that kind of fanboy nerdism. Uh, it's cool. It tells me that there's something there. Another thing that I noticed was uh, the whole idea of Grower kept coming up over and over again. So, all right. I was happy about that. By the third listen... And yeah, I got to a third listen, not because I had to or anything. It's just, I always, when I do a review, I think that I got to give a record at least two very proper listens in order to be able to establish even the slightest opinion about it. So uh, I gave this, I gave this the two listens. The third listen was more a question of now I'm reading all the hoopla and I'm liking what I hear. Uh, I hear excellent songwriting. The lyrics are starting to reveal themselves a little bit. And I'm reading all these people going completely apeshit over the national. So I pull out the lyric sheet. And I start reading along. And I start listening to the songs. And uh, by the third time, I realize that I have some of the songs in my head already. So it's like, we're half awake in a fake empire. And... Uh, it got me. And I couldn't be happier. I love being wrong. Uh, the album is amazing. Uh, Vinyl Me Please has done this a couple of times. They've failed a couple of times, but they've done it a couple of times. Uh, and the times that remind me the most is uh, Father John Misty, Love You Honey Bear, uh, which blew my mind straight the fuck away. 
and uh, Nils Fromm. But uh, this is another example of that. Just the national boxer is that good, uh, in my opinion. And now I've listened to it four times, and I haven't yet put it all together. But I know that I'm going to use the download code. That I know, because I like it that much. And I know something else. Come hell or high water, the next time I see a copy of Alligator, I'm buying it. I'm getting it. I don't care how I get it, but I'm going to get it. And I haven't heard a note off that album, just like I haven't heard a note off a uh, boxer, because I want the needle drop to mean something. I want to experience music that way. And I mean, if I have the choice, then why not? That's what the vinyl experience is all about, right? Um, so Alligator is definitely on the radar, and thanks to everybody who mentioned it. Let's go into the package a little bit and why I think Vinyl Me Please may have, uh, in, in some ways, released their best package. Uh, one reason, just one reason, but it's the biggest fucking reason in the world as far as I'm concerned. First off, as far as I know, is that this is the 10th anniversary of this pressing. Okay, it's exclusive. It's in some kind of funny color. I forgot what color it is. I think it's gray. Here you go. Look, it's gray. Okay, so it's a beautiful gray vinyl with a printed inner sleeve, very nice printed inner sleeve. So in terms of the actual packaging of the record itself, very nice. Uh, the record's a nice slab, 180 gram uh, vinyl, so there's no complaints there. The lyric sheet is just, you know, a two-pager on both sides. Fantastic, but uh, I was a little surprised to see that it's a grammatical fucking nightmare. It's just their spelling mistakes, grammar errors, and I mean, I, I don't think I'm a grammar Nazi. I'm not, but you know, you're putting out a product that's crazy, especially you're putting out a product from, uh, you know, that's being sung by somebody who's very eloquent with his words and just, there's fucking grammatical errors and typos and uh, unacceptable. Then we go into the Vinyl Me Please part of it, and I'll go into exactly what uh, really took this package over the top and was a complete slam dunk. Okay, first off, this is the original artwork. I'll try to put it more in light. It's amazing. I, this added an artistic element that I enjoyed right away. Philip Johnson is the guy who uh, put the picture together. So for me, just the fact that, uh, you know, they stretch out and try to shed light on new artists is cool because this image caught me immediately and I love it. So from an art point of view, they got this right on. I mean, I generally read the liner notes and uh, the cocktail recipe for myself. I don't keep a fully stocked bar, man. I drink a couple of beers a year. I'm not a big drinker, you know, so uh, I don't use it. How many of you guys actually make the cocktails? Because, uh, you know, you need a lot of stuff. I'm just curious. Do you guys actually go out and uh, uh, make the cocktails? I don't. Then we get to another cool thing, which I find that they do, is they give you a little one sheet of records that are coming out in uh, the next record of the store, uh, the, the, the next member store. And there's that Sister Rosetta Tharp record right under my finger. Oh, fuck, do you want that? Yeah, I know, Andy Warhol, there's the rest. But there's that Sister Rosetta Tharp in the middle. That woman in the dress clapping her hands. She's got a guitar strapped around her. You want that record. You want that fucking record. I know I want that record. So for me, that provides a really nice, tasteful teaser to what's to come. I still haven't gotten to the best part. The best part is that it came with this. It came with um, an exclusive clear seven inch of two songs off the new record. I even made notes to tell myself what the new record is called. What's the new fucking record called? My printer doesn't work properly, so it's all smudged. So. I don't remember what the new album uh, is called. But, look, I wrote it in notes, so I was actually trying to be organized this time. But I need a black cartridge. The shame just never ends here. Never fucking ends. Shame! Ding, ding! Shame! Ding, ding! Great dragon fight, right? Great dragon fight? 
You know that fucker, he's under the water. He's still alive, him and his little rat. They're still alive. So look, the deal is, two songs off the new album, which is coming out at, the, what, September 8th or something like this. I love this so much because this is what vinyl is all about. This takes me back to what the 45 was all about. The 45 is what was given to the radio stations way back, you know, 50s and so forth, even further back. But this is what would go to the radio stations, and they would play it so that, and then stock it in the stores so that people would go buy it. Radio stations got advanced copies, so the way it is that we'd get to listen to a lot of stuff was we'd listen to the radio, and they'd make a big deal out of the fact, I'm going to clean it, I know, my fingers, just chill, all right? Let's not be stupid about it. So it was always such a big deal when they got a single because it's like, oh, boy, I'm thinking to myself um, a couple of things. I, straight to Iron Maiden because, you know, Iron Maiden. But I remember when um, that first single came out, which uh, wasted years. It made me want that record so bad. And I didn't wait to go out and buy somewhere in time i bought somewhere in time on back then records came out on tuesday and yes i bought it on the day but i went and buy the single beforehand because i heard it on the radio and it completely amped me up for the record which of course is a masterpiece and the upcoming tour and so forth did the same thing with can i play with madness the tour after that and so many others this is an old way and a really vinyl way of um, promoting a new record. And it's fucking awesome. The songs are great. The songs are fun. You're going to be able to hear two of them ahead of time. It's the only place you get it. And um, it's about as bang on when it comes to the vinyl experience and what the um, tradition of the 45 is. It's put to perfect use here. Uh, I've discovered a band that uh, I'm pretty sure I'm going to keep listening to. So they got me there. I can't say it's the same thing for you guys. It'll be up to you guys. I know that I need another record necessarily, and I will make it a blind buy. And um, they used the 45 in the best fucking way possible. Uh, bravo, man. Awesome. 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 I'm going to leave that to the side, okay? I might be able to give a copy of that away. By the way, uh, this weekend is the last weekend, I believe, to order that record or even next weekend. I'm not sure, but you know me. I don't fucking remember anything. My memory's no good. But order it, vinylmeplease.com. I liked it. I loved it, actually. And I can see why it's as revered as it is. Now we're going to go to our next record, um, which is pretty cool. This right here. This came out yesterday. It's a Barnes & Noble exclusive. Sun Records tributes to Hank Williams, or what's it called? Sun Records does Hank Williams. Uh, it's fair to say that Sun Records is the birthplace of rock and roll. Elvis started there, Carl Perkins. Uh, if you really want to know what Roots is all about, that's where it started. And that's where it is that you really hear a lot of different influences coming together in order to make what eventually became rock and roll. So you hear tons of country, and you hear gospel, and but there's a little bit of flair there. And the fact that Sun Records, you know, they took anybody and brought it in and took chances on music. And, I mean, the rep cannot be touched. And we will be talking more about that because uh, the head of org music, uh, Andrew Rossiter, who puts out all of these records, uh, knows quite a bit about rockabilly and knows quite a bit about rock and roll. So it'll make an interesting conversation to talk about the Sun Catalog. I'm just absorbing it more because I'm learning, man. So I, I want to have a solid basis before it is that I can really get into any type of conversation. So check. What makes this special? A couple of things make this special. The first thing from a record perspective, actually, you know what? Let's just go from the promo perspective. I'm not sure why, but Barnes & Noble 
decided to make this weekend a vinyl weekend. So 10% uh, off vinyl is what it is that I saw as I visited the site. But what it is that they also they also did is they uh, put out this exclusive. I don't know if there were others, but they put out this exclusive Sun Records tribute to Hank Williams. It's limited to 500 copies, and and it's in nifty red vinyl. This came out yesterday. Why is it cool? I don't really care about the 500. I don't really care about the color either. One thing that I do like, though, is um, I like going deeper into classic catalogs, and this is a first-time compilation. So it's not like it's stuff that was released way back in the 50s, and I have a lot of the Roy Orbison and you know Johnny Cash's and all that stuff, but this is the first time that the songs have been compiled in this manner, and it really works. Because first off, you can see what an amazing songwriter Hank Williams was. And there are some songs that he popularized but didn't write. But you can see that Hank Williams, you know, in a lot of ways was the godfather of rock and roll because all of those artists were interpreting his music. It's a really nice cross-section of songs. It's a historical artifact because it gives you a really strong idea of what was going on. So you'll hear the beginnings of rock and roll. You'll hear the minute that Jerry Lee Lewis hits the piano, there's something there. There's, a, there's an electricity there, right? Uh, and it all revolves around Hank Williams, who, look, the best. There's nothing else to say. Can't be found anywhere else. There's only 500 of them. I'm giving a copy away. Subscribe to the podcast. I'm giving a copy away to one of you. Okay, so vinyljunkies.co slash podcast. Download, subscribe. One of you is going to get this and you want it. Can I tell you what the highlight is? Uh, there's two Johnny Cash songs. There's a um, Jerry Lee Lewis song and a bunch of artists that I don't know. For me, that's a good thing. I like the fact that I don't know a lot of this because, again, it allows me to go much deeper into the catalog without, you know, otherwise I wouldn't know it. The big song for me on this was um, Barbara Pittman, Cold, Cold Heart, because it's the last song on Sides 2. It ends the compilation, and I've just heard a bunch of guys interpret it, so you just have this idea, and then they put the Barbara Pittman song and she sings it so mournfully and fucking owns it owns it i have goosebumps thinking about how good her rendition of cold cold heart is and as far as i'm concerned that one song is worth this entire fucking compilation uh this is amazing i'm really really happy to have this and uh i've had it for four weeks so i've had a chance to play the hell out of it it's uh it's a really good new uh sun release. Highly recommended. From a fan perspective, highly, highly, highly recommended. Um where else do we go? Can I take a drink of water? Everything cool so far? All right. I'll put this down for a little while and let's continue with our reviews. This is the link ray. Oh yeah, power trips coming up. But this is the link ray that was just released by Light in the Attic. Um, it's the first part of what I've been talking about over the last bunch of uh, episodes, podcasts. It's uh, the first part of the uh, what the fuck is the name of that shack? Considering I've talked about this for so long. The Fatback Sessions. The Fatback Sessions. They were recorded in an old chicken house. Uh, using just three tracks. This one really goes into the liner notes. And it makes it fun, right? Because a huge part of this record is the stories behind it. Chicken Shack. With professional equipment in it. And... The room was a shit house. So what do you do in order to get your acoustics sounding good? They had to mic some stuff outside uh, the windows in order to get the right spacing, which made for a weird production. And the weird production is here. Believe me, it's it's it's, it's a gritty record. 
it's also brilliant. Um, another thing that they mentioned is that they had a piano in there. The thing is, is that the piano, um, there was a leak in the roof. So they had to cover it up with blankets, but it eventually went into the piano and the piano rusted. So they tried to tune it the best they could, but they can't, you can't tune a rusted piano property. So you hear some fucked up piano. Cool. I didn't know that. Makes me watch the record that much more. And of course, listen, it's this is classic, man. This is classic. Next week, I'll give you guys a copy of this, okay? Next week. Uh, tune in. So going forward, you see that uh, the producer of the record was this Italian guy that seemed to have hustled his way into the situation. And a lot of the songs on the album are credited to uh, Vernon's wife uh, for contractual reasons and a whole bunch of weird things. And one thing that's really cool here is that considering that Link Ray had a lung removed due to, what was it, tuberculosis during the war, he had, his lungs were fucked. He couldn't sing anymore. He doesn't give a shit, man. He takes his one lung and just sings. And it's a great... Great, great, great down home record. Uh, Vinyl Me Please has 300 of these in exclusive green wax. Do you like green wax? I do. And uh, what's also cool about this is... Uh, here, actually, why don't I bring this a little closer for you? There's a picture of the shack. It's a bad picture. It's kind of dark, but that's where they recorded. So, finally, the third, the first part of the trilogy is here. As far as I know, Light in the Attic is also putting together a bundle of the Link Ray stuff. And uh, one other, I think Mordecai Jones is available on VMP. But if you guys see these Link Ray records, they're not going to last forever, man. Get them now. They're, uh, this is special music. This is really great. And there's the movie about uh, Native Indians in uh, music called Rumble. Again, I don't remember the rest of it, but Rumble is the name of the movie. Um, I definitely got to check that out. So that's 300 from Vinyl Me Please. That will be the giveaway next week uh, to all of you who join the podcast. Vinyljunkies.co slash podcast. Let's move on to some metal. I've been wanting new metal uh, because metal is still awesome. Uh, I don't think that you ever really stop listening to it. You know, you talk about metalheads uh, in their 60s, and that's not a stretch. There's, you know, metal is forever, man. It's something you wear forever. Um, so I've wanted always, I always like look to see what's out there. There's a record you guys have been talking about. There's two, actually, which I haven't picked up yet, but Night Demon, which uh, my buddy Joe told me about, which I, I'm going to pick up the minute I find. And there's another one, Zeal and Ardor, that some of you, Matthias Gustafsson, has been going crazy about it. But Zeal and Ardor is another one that I'm dying to get. And um, I was really happy to see that Power Trip was included in the VMP package. Uh, this is some old-school thrash metal put out on um, Southern Lord Records. And look, it's pretty simple. Let's talk about what it reminded me of. There's a little bit of Exodus in there. There's a little bit of... Death Angel. You can literally, as you're listening to it, just see the fucking pit happening. So I can imagine being complete chaos at a power trip show. You know, you can hear a little bit of Testament and Forbidden, and it's pretty clear that power trip, I believe they're out of Dallas, um, feasted on old thrash and learned it well and made it their bitch. Because this record fucking rules. And another thing that I'm liking is I was looking for tours that they were on before, but I think they were, uh, they've been on some tours already, but they seem to be real touring machines also. So it looks like they got two major tours coming up. One's with Cannibal Corpse, and then there's another one with Exodus. There's an Exodus tour, which has Obituary on it as well, and then there's a Cannibal Corpse tour, uh, which w they will be touring with Gate Creeper. I haven't checked if there's any dates around here, but if so... Uh, I'll see what I can do about uh, maybe doing some kind of power trip thing, but definitely one of my favorite uh, metal records that I've heard this year and uh, a real throwback to the old mid to late 80s, you know, so not really kind of like Bonded in Blood, 
But, you know, once it really started getting fast and the pit started mattering, this is fucking awesome. The record is called Nightmare Logic. It came out just uh, earlier this year, 2017. You can pick it up at uh, Southern Lord or their uh, tours. They will be touring extensively, and they have been touring extensively. So, um, cool. So now we get to Explosions in the Sky. At the end, I'm going to do Tom Waits. But, uh, yeah, Explosions in the Sky. Uh, this content here, this entire review was courtesy of temporary residents who sent out all of the records. They sent me seven of their records out of a possible nine. So I have a pretty good size catalog here. Uh, and I did exactly what I uh, did with the mono catalog. That's to say that I started listening to them in chronological order and made sure that before I moved on to the next one, I'd listen to each album at least twice. Okay, and listen to it, not listen to it, do something else, like, you know, just make sure that I'm able to focus on the different elements of it. Um, so these are my impressions. Um, I listened to this and, you know, found it raw. Uh, the, the drums caught me immediately. Just loud, 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 loud drums. And um, I enjoyed the record, but okay, you know, not more than that. Now, look, just as a precursor to me saying all of this, look, this is just me telling you what my impression is. I am not a longtime fan of Explosions in the Sky, so I don't know which albums are huge. I don't know which albums are not. I've been listening to these records for two weeks, okay? intensely for the last week so my impressions are based on that so when it came to this it's like okay i like it not something i'd buy okay um what the hell is this one called i made notes for myself and everything and the reason it is that i have to get used to saying it is because just saying this one doesn't work on a podcast does it so you have to know the names of the albums how Strange Innocence is the first one released in 2000. I didn't have that one. So this one came out in 2001 on Temprez. Those who tell the truth shall die. Those who tell the truth shall live forever. That's the name of it. I liked the art. That's the first thing that came out at me. That's, I think, a running thing that I've noticed with temporary residents. They never fuck up on the art. They... They get that part of it very right. Jeremy Devine, the owner of Temporary Residence, does a lot of the uh, design work. You'll be satisfied. It's tasteful, man. Tasteful, bang for the buck. Uh, that's a genuine. That's a genuine thing. Just very, very good. So we move on, right, to this record here. This record here is called. You'll forgive me if I don't know by uh, title, but this record here is called "The Earth Is Not a Cold Dead Place," two thousand three. So two years later, and I like it, I enjoy it. As far as I know, it's um, very critically acclaimed. Uh, I did the Pitchfork thing. I did all of the Consequence of Sound and all the reviews. And uh, Pitchfork, uh, they seem to be Pitchfork darlings. People really liked, uh, Pitchfork really liked them. I found it really strange that they were crazy about uh, explosions in the sky, but when it came to mono, they found them to be average. I think it's two completely different aesthetics, and this is American, and they like it, and um, Mono is Japanese, and I guess the aesthetic didn't do it for them, but I liked it. One thing that I noticed right away is, yeah, the big deal in this band is very much the drums. The drums are propulsive. They really drive the music. Uh, noisy. Here is where I start uh, seeing a difference. And uh, this one should be somebody, someone that I know, one that I know uh, quite well, but uh, all of a sudden I miss everybody. Is that what it's called? All of a sudden I miss everyone. This came out four years after. And uh, guys, the art, man. All of a sudden I miss everyone. Just, this is a nice, thick, stout and tip-on cover, okay? Have a look at that, man. 
I wish I had remembered to include the record with this because uh, the thing I also started realizing is that this was the beginning of uh, a design theme with uh, the Explosions in the Sky record where they release double LPs and have the fourth side etched. And the etching is just the waves. And it's so beautiful that I feel like an absolute fucknut for not showing it to you. Uh, this record really started doing it for me. All of a sudden, I missed everybody or everyone. It doesn't matter, does it? I don't think titles mean that much. But I started seeing a cohesiveness, and I started seeing the music becoming sharper. I started seeing the songwriting becoming sharper and gaining a bit of focus. And... Um, then I was, as I was continuing, this was just the third one. As I continued my, uh, you know, listening sesh, um, I received a phone call uh, from my sister, who I haven't spoken in forever, who told me that my mom, who I haven't spoken to in at least half my life, estranged, uh, is uh, got leukemia. So. It takes me completely aback. Now, I'm not telling you this because I need any sympathy or anything. Look, you know, we've all dealt with death in the family, but this is a person I've been estranged from in a long, for a long time for whatever the reasons are, right? What happens to explosions in the sky when it comes to music? Here I am, I listened to the first records, and they were kind of like, okay, you know. But this was the first kind of record that I actually had put on, and then I received this news, and the thought actually went through my head that, well, I can't extricate myself from explosions in the sky anymore. This has necessarily now become the soundtrack of my life as I deal with this life situation. And we're all put in that, right? The music that gets you through a breakup, the music that gets you through the death of a loved one or the birth of a loved one. Um, and all of a sudden I missed everyone uh, became a record I could never forget. I can't forget it. I'm happy it's good. I don't know. I think Pitchfork loved it. Uh, I don't know where it stands in the catalog, but this... Uh, is fucking huge to me now, and uh, I'll understand why later. I don't know, okay, because interesting, right? So as all of this is going on, you know, you're thinking, okay, do you move forward? Of course you move forward. You have to move forward. So, nah, no excuses. You keep working, and the work is what gets you going. Now we got a big door snarled with vines, and I'm really liking the imagery. The imagery is fitting my state of mind, you know? The inside of an empty house with a note attached to a hearth and a hurricane or a tornado outside. It brings the mind to a bunch of people, and it just kind of like dovetailed perfectly with all of a sudden the tornado of old thoughts going through my own. And the music was good. And it became a soundtrack. And what's this soundtrack called? <laughs> Even the title fits. 2011. Take care. Take care. Take care. And it's the same type of thing. 2LP. And the etched fourth side. And I'm at this point beginning, you know, to wonder if there's going to be any sameness. Because they're hitting their groove, and I really like it. And now the music is definitely a part of um, my life. And then they start making soundtracks. And this soundtrack called Prince, Prince Avalanche to a movie I've never seen. But um, all of a sudden, they get minimal. And they start focusing on the most emotive elements of their music. And rather than go for that big bang or having drums propulse, they start using other instruments and using accents like never before to convey emotions like you would in um, in a movie. And a lot of the stuff that came before, as far as I know, look, I, I was listening to it and it's, it sounded like a commercial. I'm kind of guessing that it was probably featured in commercials. If it was, please leave it in the notes. I'd love to know, honestly, because it does seem to work. You know, it's very cinematic. But here on this album here, Prince Avalanche, 
is where they just go full on soundtrack and where I really begin in terms of compositionally and in terms of what this band is about is where it is that I really start taking notice. I'm a long time fan of soundtracks and I love how music can emote a feeling and you know, the marriage of the picture of the, on the screen to the music. It's, it's magic, you know, and I thought they nailed it. So I became more interested did the fact that uh, explosions in the sky um, have take on bigger meaning have uh, anything to do with it? Maybe. I don't think so, but maybe. And then they do another soundtrack, and this one's screen printed, or at least it feels screen printed, Manglehorn. And I like this soundtrack better than I liked the soundtrack before, and... It's not using the same themes as the soundtrack before. I'm hearing, am I hearing oboes? Am I hearing woodwinds? Hey, this is not just uh, formulaic. There's something really cool happening here that's actually reminding me a little bit of the subtlety that you'll hear in Sigur Rós albums. But I then accept that this band... Uh, is up my alley, and uh, I could not recommend Manglehorn more. This record is freaking amazing. So for those of you that joined the podcast and have picked a record, this one's a good one. It's a single one, okay, but uh, it's a mind blower as far as I'm concerned. And then we get to the new one, or the latest one, which came out in 2016, The Wilderness. And this is super deluxe packaging, and you're really getting the feeling that now, okay, they did the kind of like heavy drum propulsed stuff. And then, you know, they found subtlety and nuance in uh, their film albums. And here they kind of put it all together. And it's focused songwriting. It takes you on that ride. And it's beautiful. And it sounds like they're masters. I would love to have heard this on tour. Now, super deluxe packaging means that you got to pull it out and you got to do a bunch of things to it. I'm not even going to do it. Why? Because it's beautiful, but the packaging is a complete pain in the ass to put back together after. Uh, I like beautiful packaging, uh, but if it's making my life complicated, then, you know, I think of the mono package there with uh, the red piece of paper and the instructions on how to make uh, an origami swan. That, to me, was cool. You know, I, I liked that. But anyway, okay, that doesn't really matter, right? So that is the entire Explosions in the Sky catalog. Uh, check out temporaryresidence.com. Pick your prize. It's still coming at the end um, uh, of this broadcast. And uh, join our podcast at vinyljunkies.co slash podcast. Download the episodes, and uh, you can win. You can. And, yes, I do look at all of that uh, in choosing the winners. Last story? No, actually second to last story. Kind of like a short one. I don't even know why I included this one. Well, I received it uh, in the VMP package, so I have most of Tom Waits' catalog. Uh, this was very much a, a big uh, missing part of the catalog. Swordfish trombones was the beginning of a complete change in uh, Tom Waits' catalog, so I guess it gives me an opportunity to talk very briefly of the three periods you know, maybe four, but three periods of Tom Waits' catalog. Um, you can say, if you want to say four, there's the folk period, very folksy stuff, um, where he was being compared to Bruce Springsteen. And early on in his career, they kind of like were wondering, okay, well, which one of these guys will break through? You know, there was this comparison between Tom Waits and Bruce Springsteen. And, I mean, the songwriting is there. But those first years then, we got the Electra years. The Electra, the Asylum years. No, sorry, it's the Asylum years, right? Um, that goes from not small change, but closing time. From closing time all the way to um, the heart of Saturday night. And here you see him as a craftsman, but you see him take on kind of like this dark uh, gumshoe persona. 
he has this noir persona that kind of like um, makes me think sometimes of beat poets or hard-boiled crime novelists, you know. So this whole um, diner aesthetic is very big to him and cigarettes and gumshoes, you know. And uh, I'm pretty sure that my fascination with eating at diners at the counter has is very directly influenced by Tom Waits. And drinking bad coffee at a diner uh, just so, kind of seems like par for the course, you know, in those big ceramic mugs. So then we go into this period here, which is the island years. And the island years is where he starts getting full-on weird. And this is the record that starts the weird period. He was already getting weird, and the stories he was taking, his characters were taking on... Um, more heft, you know, but here he just seems to almost forget the uh, themes that he was revolving around and just goes off and fucking makes his own language. And it's the weirdest thing. It's it blew me away then and it blows me away now. So this is the actual first record of the island years where, you know, second period of his life, second a phase of his career where things start getting really uh, crazy. I could not recommend it more, and I feel even foolish recommending a record from Tom Waits because I think all Tom Waits is necessary. What's interesting about this also is before this switch between the Asylum years and um, this here, the Island years, he put out a record that it seems like not a lot of people know about, but everybody I know that knows this record adores it, rightfully so. This came out on Columbia Records, and it's a soundtrack that he does, a duet soundtrack that he does with uh, Crystal Gale for the movie called One from the Heart. And to say that it's one of my favorite records in the Tom Waits catalog is an understatement. This is a fucking masterpiece. Hearing Crystal Gale sing about old boyfriends and just them singing as a couple you know, and riffing off each other and singing, you know, Crystal Gale singing her parts of the lines uh, uh, of the story while Tom Waits rebuts with his part, you know, old boyfriends and so forth, broken bicycles. It's just, it's a wonderful piece of music. It's really sublime. It's not crazy at all. It gets crazy only right after. And uh, the fun part about this record is that before Crystal Gale was chosen, uh, they wanted uh, to have Beth Midler do the record, but she couldn't due to commitment. So that's how Crystal Gale wound up on it. If you see it, I could not possibly recommend it more. It's fucking masterful. It really is. All right. So, do I even want to get it? Okay. Record collectors are pretentious assholes. I'm not angry or nothing, but something really cool happened yesterday and I think it's still today check out Google all right you know the Google doodles at the top right above the uh, search bar they always uh, mark certain anniversaries yesterday and even today I don't know if it's going on until the weekend but they marked the 44th anniversary of hip-hop so they made this doodle with DJ cool Herc narrating the whole thing from New York where they take two decks and they create a virtual crate of records with classics Right, so they got incredible bongo band in there, and they have uh, DJ Cool Herc records and Skull Snaps and a Billy Squire record and a whole bunch of stuff that really contributed towards the beginning of hip hop culture. And during this entire thing, what they did was they put together this kind of like achievement, um, ten achievements, which uh, you unlock one at a time as you play around with the doodle. So they encourage you to play with the doodle. They have two uh, turntables, right? So it's kind of like you just scroll with your mouse. I don't know how it is on a pad or whatever. I, I did it on my computer, but you kind of scroll on a mouse and you can kind of scratch with it and you can switch records around. Then they tell you, okay, for, you know, to get the first piece of news, this is what you have to do in order to get this achievement. They give you the achievement. When you get the achievement, let's say it's just, you know, put the Apache beat on for the first time. So you put it on. And what it does is it unlocks a piece of neat information about the history of hip hop. And I don't remember if it was Apache beat, but really it gives you a nice story, backstory to hip hop. 
in a completely interactive way that I had fun spending at least 30 or 35 minutes doing. Like, it was just fun. And what I liked most about it was non-vinyl people, my non-vinyl friends were contacting me and saying, hey, man, did you check the Google Doodle? It's fun. It's like, oh, yeah, I've been all over it, man. It's, I really enjoyed it. So for me, the fact that they were showing this virtual creative records and kind of like doing all of this and it was being exposed to people outside the vinyl world, I thought was something extremely cool. It's like, yeah, man, I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy that Google did this. Where it is that I start not getting it uh, and the whole pretentious asshole thing comes into the picture is a lot of stories were put out, right? So obviously the vinyl mags put out the uh, various stories and I think that's pretty normal, you know. Um, one of my favorite vinyl mags and one that you read all the time as well, I'm sure, is uh, Vinyl Factory uh, based out of the UK. Really good. I mean, I follow them on every social media because they do re uh, report the news. And, uh, yeah, I think that uh, as I try to keep up with vinyl news, it becomes an important source, and I think they do it well. Highly respected as far as I'm concerned, right? So they get a writer uh, whose name I don't remember. I, I believe it's a female. But they get a writer to uh, make an article around this um, Google Doodle, which is cool, right? Because it's like it's part of vinyl news and it gives them clicks. So I get it. The whole thing, beautiful, right? Okay, so I was cool with all of that. And they tell you exactly how the whole thing works. And then they start getting into opinion. And this is where it is that I start having problems. Uh, I will include the link, by the way, uh, to the article so that you can draw your own conclusions as to what it is. I'll tell you how I felt about it. But maybe I'm completely off and maybe i got to stick up my ass and I'm too serious about the whole thing. But whatever. You be the judge for yourself. The link will be available on the podcast, okay? So the opinion part goes to, and I'm reading directly, the crate contains iconic wax like the Isley Brothers between the sheets and Timmy Thomas' Why Can't We Live Together alongside a few of the site's most uh, sites own imprint, a Google original, a Google original. The 808 sample, 808 volume one. Sounds pretty familiar for an original, right? While Polka Music Volume 1 is a straight-up disaster. So this is the stuff that Google kind of like added to classic records to add to it. So uh, we got a critique on how uh, bad it was. Yes, you can help you fold. Uh, yes, Google can help you fold jockey. But it can't help you figure out why two songs just don't sound right mixed into each other, even when they're perfectly beat matched. So on top of complaining about the stuff that they put in, then, you know, they got to put their own little two cents, their professional two cents on matching beats. And to me, the whole thing stunk from the head down because that's, as far as I'm concerned, the perfect example of not enjoying the forest for the trees. And when people talk about vinyl uh, purists being pretentious assholes, I get it. I read those lines and, you know, beat matching and I got douche chills. I don't know the person. It's not personal. I mean, I'm just talking. It's Google celebrated vinyl culture. Google celebrated music and hip hop. Introduced it to a bunch of people. They put time and resources into this and made it fun. And it looks like now it might be an entire weekend thing. It's a beautiful fucking thing. And you're complaining. Why are you complaining? Is the critique even necessary? You know those types when they go to restaurants, right? And there's a beautiful experience. The meal is nice. Attention to detail. And then there's those types. There's always those types. The fucking pricks that have to justify the tip, right? Like you somehow have to be their personal slave. So it's kind of like, oh, well, you know what? You didn't really give me my condiments, my coffee got cold, whatever. Use an excuse so that you can, quote unquote, talk the tip down. You see all sorts of that shit online. Assholes that don't understand the service industry. This is exactly the same fucking thing. Just nitpicking for what? This beautiful thing that's vinyl themed just happened worldwide. And you decided to be a fucking asshole about it. You know? A beautiful picnic, and guess who brought the fucking ants? Vinyl Factory. Why? You guys are amazing. You're better than that. 
that's my two cents. Like I said, maybe uh, serious. Uh, may, may, maybe I'm the one with a stick up my ass. I don't know. I don't care. That's the show, guys. We're done. We're going to pick winners, all right? Hope you enjoyed it. So one more time, these, uh, you know, exclu- for, for podcast subscribers, vinyljunkies.co slash podcast is where you go in order to be a part of it. And we got names. We've got names. All right. Who do we give this to? Joanna Marie, you're going to win a copy of, what are you winning a copy of? Fuck. Judd Lemke, you have a like the longest beard I've ever seen. And as far as I know, you've said that you've never, ever, ever, ever cut your beard. So you might be like one of the biggest hillbillies I, I know. So I think that the Hank Williams record should be yours. You know, just hillbilly love. Hank Williams goes to Judd Lemke. What's the other one that I said I was giving away? I'm going to be giving away a copy of uh, Explosions in the Sky, right? Um, Joanna Marie, you're going to win a copy of Explosions in the Sky. Just visit Temporary Residence, pick one out from what they have, and uh, we'll be happy to send it along to you. So uh, thanks for watching, guys. Congratulations. Next week, more stuff coming through. I don't remember. And yes, the sound's not done yet. The T-shirts are almost all gone, all right? So... No more trouble with t-shirts. It's almost all done. Later, guys. Love you all. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.